Hello, my name is Joy Ashby Cornplay, and I will be your host for this episode of the live stream show, My Diabetes HQ Live. Today, our guests will discuss the basics of health insurance, because let's face it, insurance can be a very confusing prospect. Having a better understanding of how health insurance works can help you choose a health plan, manage medical appointments, access medications and supplies, and understand your medical bills. Stay tuned. Today's episode is coming up right now and you don't want to miss it. Before we begin, a gentle reminder, the content that is shared during the My Diabetes HQ live broadcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, nor treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding any medical condition. So let's welcome our guest today. We have Tim Schauer. Good morning. Hi, Tim. Good morning. Um, can you tell the viewers what you do, Tim? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Schauer, and I am a lobbyist, and I work on health insurance issues, and I've been working on health care and health insurance for almost 30 years in the Texas legislature and in, at, uh, in Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, and I saw our caveat said it's not medical uh, we, you know, we're not giving any medical advice. Let me add one more caveat. I'm also not an insurance broker. So my advice, if you really are in the market to buy health insurance, listen to what we're going to give you some great guidance today, but use a health insurance broker. These people are licensed and highly trained to work with you and your specific needs to, to help you buy insurance. But we're going to give you some really great guiding points today on things to ask, on how to be a better consumer. So I look forward to, to talking with everybody today. Excellent, thank you, Tim. We're so pleased to have you here. We also have um, CORE, Cities Changing Diabetes Houston team members with us today. We have Serena Valentine, CEO of CORE Initiatives and our Cities Changing Diabetes Houston peer support lead. We also have Reva Verma, CEO of Reneka Digital. She is um, also a CCD core team member working on My Diabetes HQ. So thank you ladies for joining us. Good morning. Excellent. So as we start off, I just wanted to kind of begin with a little bit of a story about how someone begins going through like say a healthcare visit and then we can apply some Diabetes 101 on top of that. So I'm gonna give you guys a game today, this morning really early to think about. Um, this is someone just checking in, going through their visit, having a plan with their physician, heading to the pharmacy and um, calling for a follow-up and some paperwork. So where do you all think that insurance may come into play? I think the prior authorization, um, I know from personal experience, that can be a pain, <laughs> that part. <laughs> anyone, anyone else want to throw something out there? Any of those spots might be sticklers or challenges for someone living with diabetes? So Joy, it's at every literal step in the picture. If you don't have insurance, you can't even get to the first step. You have to go to a different clinic sometimes. And then whether you get this doctor or that, every single step in, in what you showed, insurance plays a role because every step you showed has some financial transaction related to it. And, and that's what insurance is really about. Most people think insurance is about covering you and helping you. Uh -uh, it's about your financial transactions, about every step of accessing the health system. Yeah, so I circled a few. I know Tim, you that's beautiful that you said it's in every step because it really is. But there's a few like really strong sticking points that I'll have you cover too. So this is the copay like you talked about, Tim. If you don't have insurance, it may be very difficult to get in the door. Um, it's January 14th, so it's the beginning of, for many people, their calendar year. 
Um, here, this person's going to the pharmacy to pick things up, but apparently something's gone wrong. Um, they've called back their physician. Um, there's Serena's prior authorization and all of the delays that come along with it. So Tim, can you take us through where did insurance even, you know, where are its origins? Sure. Why is it so hard? Yeah, you bet, Joy. Um, and it's my pleasure. And again, this, this is an issue that America has been grappling with for over a hundred years. Um, and I can tell you that the reason health insurance came about was not because somebody wanted to help people gain access to health care. It was because they wanted to protect people from going bankrupt if they got sick or hurt. So I think the most important thing to remember is that while most people now think about health insurance as reducing my costs of what I need in a daily living situation, it's initially from people getting sick and hurt and losing everything. If they didn't have anything, they literally lost everything. So even in the, in the, in the mid 1800s, um, accident insurance came into place. And so if, if you had an accident, at least, and you survived it, remember that, that prior to the 1920s, if you got, a, a, you know, even just cut or, or injured, you know, um, you, had a, you had a high risk of infection that would go septic and kill you. Um, it, was, it was pretty tough living in those times. But as our science and technology advanced, and as we got better at saving people's lives, it got more expensive. And the more expensive it got, the more difficult it got for the average person to afford getting that care. Now, this is where America veers away from the rest of the, of the developed world, is that in the early 1900s through about the 1950s, when every other, other civilized country in the world said, you know what, healthcare is probably a right. Healthcare is probably something that we should do for everyone. And of course, the big boogaboo word that Americans freak out about is, oh, that sounds like socialism to me. No, it was reasonable, rational people that said, you know, everybody has a risk of getting sick and hurt. Everybody has that chance, right? So let's build a system that makes sure that no one gets left behind if they get sick or hurt. So every other country built some sort of mechanism so that no matter who you are or what your station is in life, you have access to care. And of course, some people, again, call that socialized medicine. And then they think that there's only one system, either socialized medicine or the American model. And there's not. Um, there's so many different models. I lived in Germany for a year back in uh, the 80s, and they have what's called the Krankenkasse, which is the sick bank. And everyone pays into the sick bank. And if you get sick or hurt, you use that. And, and, uh, and, and interestingly enough, though, if you decide you want more, you can always buy more there. Then you got the Canadian model and they, they cover everybody. So you've got all these different things. But what did America do? That's a great question. Um, because American insurance has become one of the most complex, convoluted, difficult processes to, to navigate because it's, it's been a crazy history that we, we, we built it. Um, most people don't know that it here in Texas was actually the original health insurance, if you will, model. And it was up in Dallas, the teachers came together and they formed what was the predecessor of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that was in the 1920s. Um, and so they started saying, you know what, maybe we should, maybe if we all pooled a little bit of money each month, wouldn't it be smart if one of us, you know, or one out of a hundred of us gets sick, that that, that person gets taken care of? And, and they said, yeah, that's a pretty good idea um, because you never know if you're that one. And interestingly enough, Every single one of us has about a three to 5% chance in any given year of having a significant healthcare need. About another five to 7% of us are gonna have a moderate healthcare need. So a minimal injury, like for example, uh, last summer I fell and I broke my arm uh, playing hockey. Well, that wasn't a critical, that wasn't a hundred thousand dollars worth of care. It was an emergency visit. It was a quick in and out, they splinted it. I had to go back to the doctor, they put a thing in. But all told, that was about a $6,000 expense. After I got, you know, when, once I got all the way from the injury to full recovery it was about $6,000. Now, thank God I had insurance because I don't know about you guys, but most people don't have $6,000 sitting around waiting for an injury to happen like that. So um, so these things have, have changed over time. And in America, 
we've we've pieced together piece by piece by piece um, coverage for populations that need it. Okay, so we started it way back in the 1920s. During World War II, they put some some wage controls on. And so a lot of companies said, well, we can't give people raises. What can we do to keep our talent inside of our company? And some of them said, hey, you know what? Let's let's give them this new thing called health insurance. And so Kaiser Permanente did some things. And then you get through the 60s and they added Medicaid and Medicare. And so that took care of the elderly and the children and the pregnant moms. And then there were still lots and lots of people that were working that their companies didn't provide them health insurance so over the next 30 years, it became so frustrating because if you got sick or hurt, but you were low income, you didn't have access to it. So the Clintons tried to do some health reform back in the 90s. And then you get into the Obama administration and they passed health insurance reform. So now they tried to get access for everyone to get into health care. But then the federal government and particularly the Supreme Court said you can't force states to give Medicaid to everybody. So we still are in Texas here where we have a large population of people still don't have insurance. So insurance in America has been cobbled together by a whole lot of different policies and government positions. And then to even make things more complicated, we continuously change the model of healthcare. Back in the 60s, you had kind of the Blue Cross Blue Shield model, which covered health or hospitalization and a doctor visit, but no pharmacy. Well, it was because it really wasn't much more than penicillin and aspirin and a few other things so as pharmacy wasn't really a financial demand, they didn't have it. And then if you go through the 70s and 80s, more and more people started adding um, adding pharmacy coverage to their insurance. And it wasn't until 2005 that Medicare beneficiaries got the pharmacy benefit added to Medicare. So we keep complicating things here in America by doing different things. And one of the big changes that we also did in the 70s and 80s, we went from this, what was called an indemnity plan, which was if you had a hospital and you had a doctor that would take your insurance, great. Then you went and we'll talk about co-pays and deductibles and all that in a little bit. But we said, you know what? I bet there's a better way to do it. And they looked at Kaiser Permanente in California and they said, we can create an HMO. And so we really complicated things then. And then people say, well, we don't like HMOs because it's too tightly defined. I have to go to this doctor in this hospital. And so somebody came up with a new acronym and said, let's go with a PPO, a preferred provider organization. So they did contracts and all sorts of things. So not only do we have a complicated net of how people get coverage, but even if you have coverage, there's complications within it to figure out how to use it, where to use it, to which clinic can I go to, which doctor can I go to? And mind you, most healthcare decisions that are really expensive are made when you are really sick or really hurt. And raise your hand if you think you make great decisions when you're really sick or really hurt, right? You don't. Um, you are hand. struggling. You go to the closest place. It's very frustrating. So um, so that we're going to try to, to to unwind a little bit of some of that frustration, but that's kind of how we got here. Instead of taking a really comprehensive view of what, what we need as a society, We've cobbled together this population and that population and this need and that need and this community and every state has a different model. By the way, if I explain to you exactly how the Texas system works, but you live in, in New Jersey or California, you're probably tilting your head going, why do you guys do it that way? But if you're in California and you start explaining your program to people in New Jersey, the people in New Jersey might go, well, why do you guys do it that way? So we actually don't have an American healthcare system. I always laugh when I hear people tell me about an American healthcare system. We have 50 different systems in every state. Every state has different safety net mechanisms. Every state has different insurance laws and rules. So we're gonna give you some general guidance today, but you really need to look at what's going on in your state and find a broker in your state to help you navigate through this process because God bless America. I love this country. It's a great place to live, but we do some crazy stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for that um, for that wrap up and kind of understanding a wraparound understanding of how we came to be here. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. And so um, let's just begin with some one hundred and one, and just for people to know where they are in the in the video in the show. That's what we're going to start with right now, Diabetes 101. These are some insurance words to know. 
Um, we've adapted this from Health Literacy Media's work with Cover Missouri. They have fantastic little snippets that cover each one of these terms. If you wanna go back, they're one to two minute short videos where you can watch someone speak, listen. It covers all of your different type of learning, um, the ways that you learn best. So let's begin with a premium. So the premium is what you pay for your health insurance. Can you elaborate a little bit more about this, Tim? And then we can talk to Raven and Serena about when this comes into play. Sure, and and again, just for fun, instead of calling things what normal people would call them, we even make up words to confuse people. And what the heck is a premium? Exactly. Premium sounds like something like when you go to, get, to the gas station, you can buy regular, medium, or premium gas, right? But no, mm -hmm. in this case, premium simply means your monthly price. How much do you pay to just have a ticket to that? What's the ticket price to get into the show? So think of it as a monthly cost, that's your monthly fee to be in that health insurance plan. It doesn't buy anything yet other than the fact you get a card. And that means that if you have a catastrophic need, if you're sick or hurt, that that system will cover you. There's no details to it yet. We're going to get into the details. That's simply your monthly rate. That's your price. Why we call it premium? I have no idea. Again, it's quirky and weird. And we I think sometimes we do stuff in America just to confuse the consumer. And in this situation, premium is the term for the rate that you pay every month. Mm -hmm. And is that different, Tim, for those who um, have insurance through their um, through their work or for those who are self, um, you know, who are business owners, small business owners? That's a great question because a lot of people, particularly if you work for a large corporation, you don't even know what your premium is um, because it's paid for behind the scenes, right? The Your employer says as part of the compensation of you working here at, you know, let's pick a big company, um, uh, Amazon, right? Or, or Exxon Mobil or one of these really huge corporations or Google or, you know, pick it. If you work there, they say, we will cover you. And then here's the trick. Sometimes it's just, we'll cover you and your premium, right? So you won't even see that. We'll just give you a Blue Cross Blue Shield or a Cigna or a United card, whatever. You're part of it. But some of some companies will say, but we won't cover your spouse and we won't cover your family. That's up to you. So do you want it or not? So every every year you have what's called that annual enrollment period and you have to decide do I want to cover my spouse? Do you have a spouse? I mean, do you want to cover your spouse? Do you want to cover your kids? What's the best way to decide how to do that? Every family situation is different. Um, but, but when you look at that annual enrollment, in some cases, the company will say, you know what, if you've got a family, we'll cover your spouse and family, and you don't even know what you're paying. It's behind the scenes. Most people don't realize that if your company is that generous, and some of them still are, they may be actually benefiting you to the tune of about a thousand dollars a month. But if it's, you may never see that. Some people, some companies will say, we'll cover you 100%. We'll cover your spouse at 50%. And, and if you have children, you're on your own. You got to add that to. So every company does it a little bit differently. Um, and, and figuring out what your needs are and what your company does is really important. So in my situation, my wife's a teacher. So she actually has a really good package up through the school for her coverage, but her kids coverage, the kids coverage on her side isn't very good. So I have myself covered and my kids covered on mine, but my wife is actually on her own insurance. So it can get really complicated. Yeah, but there's always, it's always good to talk about those choices, right? So, because sometimes I think people don't even realize they have the choice to have one spouse on one insurance, with the children and then one spouse. And it may be, you know, that one spouse has one child on theirs and one child. One, there's all sorts of um, options, right, to the puzzle. Um, Reva, you've talked before about um, being a business owner and, um, and insurance. Can you tell us a little bit about how that has informed your diabetes care and, and your choices around insurance, for example, like premiums? Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so like Joy said, I am a small business owner and I own and operate Renega Digital, which is a full service digital marketing company. Um, we're a young company, so our employees are generally healthy. So in order to keep our health insurance costs in check, we had con contracted for high deductible insurance plans for our employees and myself. Um, for the first few years, that was manageable, but with the so since I have diabetes and I'm insulin dependent, when the rise in insulin cost became unmanageable, and for your reference, I was paying about twelve hundred dollars a month just for a thirty day supply of insulin. We just couldn't do that anymore. So for the last two years, um, no, sorry. So after, so fast forward two years, um, now I am on a low deductible plan so that I'm able to spread the cost out over months. But, you know, I'm not actually saving any money. It's affecting my bottom line. So it's just more about do I shell out the cash early in the year and go broke basically or you know spread it out over the course of the year um yeah so it, there, there's not a good balance to that in my opinion yeah and i you know i think it's a good segue into explaining what a deductible is as well um reva so let's let's talk about that and then we're going to come back to to what you were saying <laughs> about how difficult it is to make that decision about mm -hmm. when to, you know, when to pay out all of the money so that your insurance will help cover you. So a deductible um, is what you pay before the insurance shares costs with you. Okay. Do you want to expound on that, Tim, for us? Yeah. Right so, um, Back in the 70s and 80s, um, some of the insurance companies got this idea that they had to discourage people from using their health insurance. They wanted people to have what they used to call skin in the game. And they had this attitude that if they put a little hook or a little, little barrier to care, that people would think twice about going in and using their health care. Now, what's to me, and, and by the way, no research has ever supported that deductibles and copays actually change the overall costs. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was at a presentation, an economist at Rice uh, University posted uh, a big deep dive into global research on, on what these things do. And, and, it, and it does nothing more than save the insurance company some money, which is ridiculous when you really look at it. But the, the deductible is supposed to put skin in the game. So Reva, you have to think about whether you're going to go and use that healthcare before you go and do it. And then once you've paid your first, you know, couple of thousand dollars, some people have a low deductible, which may be $500. Some people have a high deductible that may be as high as seven to $10,000 that you use that before you use health insurance. Now, why is that to me, policy-wise, a really dumb idea? Is because if you're sick or hurt, or you have an ongoing healthcare need, you have a need. This is not something that you're going to go, gosh, you know what? I don't want to treat my diabetes for a few months and everything will be okay. I'm going to just skip it for a while. That's ridiculous. You have to go through this deductible process before you get it. And so to Rave's point, you can either do it big at the beginning or spread it out across the thing. So to, to me, uh, again, policy-wise, it's not a good idea, but it's one of these remnants that in America, by God, we've had it for a long time and we're going to keep it, even if it's a bad idea. And so we've got to, um, I, in my opinion, really think about what it is that we do in these financial models. Um, but, but a lot of the health insurance companies keep them and it's, it's horribly frustrating because it doesn't, in, in the long run and in the big picture, it doesn't do anything other than just take people, take money out of people's pockets who really need that, particularly in our, our working and lower income class folks. Mm -hmm. And so um, to continue, so first you have a, you have your premium that you pay monthly, and then you have your deductible, which is the part that you have to put skin in the game before the insurance will start to help you do any, any sort of payment. So from there, once you meet your deductible, um, you get coinsurance, okay? So if a service costs, say $100, you may pay 20% of that, which is $20, and the insurance will pay 
um, the remainder if you have met your deductible, okay? And so this is important to what Reva was saying. So if you have a very high deductible, you may not be able to get to the point where the insurance will um, pay for any portion of your care for a very long time. Is that what you were saying, Reva? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to, you can choose to have a lower deductible so that you could meet it in a shorter period of time, but you may have a little bit of a higher coinsurance. And that allows you to spread the cost month to month versus all up front at the beginning of your calendar year for your insurance. Right. Okay. So then we come to the copay. There's a fixed amount for each visit. Tim? And again, this is one of these things that was designed back in the 70s to discourage people from overusing healthcare. Now, the reason that I also, in just, in just conversational thinking, is how many of you wake up in the morning and go, gosh, I'm gonna go get some more healthcare. It's not like ice cream. It's not like going to a bar and you're like, yeah, I wanna do this hey, I want to go and get poked and prodded and I want people to give me a shot in the arm and I want somebody to cut me open and remove part of my body because it has cancer in it. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, gosh, I want to consume more healthcare. It's just a silly thing. But the insurance industry is convinced that that's what it is. So they have to, they have to make you feel it a little bit every time you go in. Um, and it's, it, it, to, to me, it's, again, one of those really frustrating things. The only part of the copay that, that I actually think is somewhat intelligent because it makes you feel it a little bit is several years ago, we allowed these, these freestanding emergency rooms to pop up all over the place. And they are a humongous ripoff. They're extremely expensive. They try to get you as fast as they can. And most of them, quite frankly, don't have insurance contracts. So you end up paying out of network. You do a lot of stuff there. So if you are at least slightly informed consumer, and, and again, these, these things have popped up in only a few states. So if you don't have them in your state, be glad you don't want them. Don't ask for freestanding emergency rooms in your state. They're horrible. Go to a clinic or a doctor, get the care you need. And of course, whatever your copay happens to be is what you have to pay at the door there. So Again, it's frustrating, but that's what it was designed for, was to discourage you from using healthcare. Awesome. So the next question is, at what point, I thought insurance covers me 100%. Um, at what point, <laughs> Serena's shaking her head. So that's a question that some people will, will ask. You know, they think I'm getting my insurance, I'm paying my premium. Why do I pay anything? What's going to... Like I thought the insurance was going to cover me 100%. Well, let's talk about out-of-pocket costs and the 100%. So out-of-pocket costs are the money that you pay for health services yourself, okay? So the money that you pay out. This may include and can include your deductibles, your coinsurance, and your co-payment. It does not include your premium. So after you have met your deductible, um, or after you have met your total out-of-pocket costs with all of these other small pieces adding into that, then the insurance will pay 100%, okay? But it's a contract between you and your insurance. So talk about um, the, the out-of-pocket cost, Tim. So really quick on the out-of-pocket cost, interestingly enough, this has been acknowledged for years as being overwhelming to some families and overwhelming that, that if you never put a cap on this, that, that it literally, again, it, it forces people to go broke. They can't meet that, that thing. So years ago, um, they put in particularly below, um, and I'm gonna use some terms that I don't mean to use, but they're federal terms, the, of the federal poverty level is a, is a determination based on your income of, of your household. And, and there's, there's levels of it. So at 100% of the federal poverty level or one, you know, one time, exactly what the federal level of, of poverty is and below, most people on that are either Medicaid or uninsured. And, and quite frankly, even if you tried to get money out of their pockets, they generally don't have any money in their pockets. So clinics and hospitals don't try to get a whole lot out of that. But as you rise up in your income ladder, more and more of your income can go towards these out-of-pocket costs. But the Affordable Care Act that was passed back during the Obama administration 
put some caps on at a percentage and and it starts if you're if you're 100 to a 200 percent of the federal poverty level you're capped at about two percent you can't spend any more than two percent as a as a total out of pocket and then it goes all the way up to 400 percent which was capped at eight and a half percent um but then at four percent or 400 percent and above which is most people that are in small businesses that are that are you know making fairly good money that wasn't capped so in some cases if if you had kind of a crappy insurance package that didn't have much out-of-pocket caps that out-of-pocket cap may be that every year you needed to budget 15 or 17 or twenty thousand um, dollars to to cover your needs and that's crazy that's really not very good health insurance um, if that's indeed if you're diabetic if you know you have ongoing costs you want to have as low an out-of-pocket cap as possible so if you're in the private insurance market, you can and figure out and shop around and find one that has lower out-of-pocket limits, right? But those cost a little bit more in the premium piece. Whereas if you pay, pay less in premium, you may have higher out-of-pocket costs. So, so these games that have been played have been very frustrating. Now, I do have good news in that. Two weeks ago, when, the, when Congress acted and passed the uh, American Rescue Plan, they actually capped it for everybody and said, no matter what your level is, you can never, you should never pay above eight and a half percent. I believe that's the total number that they landed on of your total income to healthcare. That's it. It's a cap. So it's going to take a little while for that to roll through the system and get fully implemented across the board. But that is a federally protected cap now that, that will help people buy their insurance and keep an insurance that doesn't, again, um, have them going broke or having to declare bankruptcy if they have a major expense. Now, if I can, really quick, major expenses that I'm talking about are hospitalizations, emergencies, situations where you're very sick or hurt, where you need surgery, where you're in a really difficult situation. General everyday care, if you're managing your diabetes very well and you're getting those pharmacies, those are those upfront costs oftentimes are not even in some of these back backdoor risk coverage. So health insurance is protecting your risk, your front dollar piece. And this is where Serena um, can jump in and really talk about helping people get those first dollar at issues covered so that they can avoid the big expensive stuff. Um, one of my good friends who's who's diabetic he went through um, uh, what I would kind of call diabetes denial when he first got it and was acting like he didn't have it and was doing all sorts of things. And sure enough, his wife ended up having to call um, Life Flight because he was catatonic. He went into a diabetic coma at their house and he was life, float, life flighted back to the hospital. They were able to get him back. It was really scary for, for them, but that was an unbelievably expensive bill. I mean, flying in a helicopter isn't cheap. And then being in the hospital for two days for them to get his, his sugar levels balanced was unbelievably expensive. So it would it would be smart, in my opinion, if we took care of and made sure that the first dollars of all the things that you need to manage your diabetes are covered by the insurance company so they can avoid that super big expensive cost of flying in the helicopter, getting the emergency room, all that forty to $50,000 worth of costs could have been avoided for the cost of a couple hundred dollars worth of the, of, of the basic stuff. So that's one of the big things that is frustrating to me when you really look at, at what some of these weird insurance incentives do to screw up the actual delivery of healthcare. Yeah, and I think I'll let Serena jump in because she, she is um, living with diabetes, but also our peer support leader here in Houston. And you've voiced some situations in which people are saying to you that they they want to seek preventative care, um, but they they can't. Um, yes, actually, there's been quite a few um, issues, especially since uh, the pandemic began and people started losing their jobs, and that means they lost connection to healthcare insurance as a result of that. Um, a lot of people either they'll they'll ask me, uh, Miss Serena, I want to get help and I want to go to the doctor, but it just costs me too much money. I have to pay my bills. I have to eat. I got a family to take care of, and so they they come to me and ask me for advice, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not a healthcare healthcare insurance 
expert. So, but I, I get a lot of those questions in peer support. Um, also, one that actually came up in my head is uh, I deal with a lot of folks who have Medicaid, Medicare, or uh, are even including myself on disability and they get in insurance, you know, and but the question is, so a lot of people are now thinking, well, that doesn't, it doesn't cover all of my costs. So they're even considering getting an extra, having to pay for an extra plan just to cover the other things that they need. And so it's become like really like this, this merry-go-round for them. And they're like, well, <laughs> I can't, if, if I was even eligible to get Medicaid, you know, how can I purchase an extra insurance policy or an insurance plan just to cover the things that would not get covered, you know? So I don't know. What would be your advice, Tim, for them if they have that problem? You know, the first thing that I, I give advice for folks that are in that situation is don't try to solve it yourself. Go, um, we have a lot, and in, in, in the Houston area, I can tell you we have what's called FQHCs, Federally Qualified Health Centers. And of course, that those letters aren't on the front door, but Legacy Clinic, for example, uh, El Centro de Corazon, uh, we've got a lot of these clinics. And every one of those clinics have social workers who are in those positions to help people access the programs they need to get the services that they need. So you're not alone, no matter where you are in this country, there are clinics and those clinics pay for social workers and people to be there to help you navigate the system. It's ridiculous that we have to pay people to navigate a system, but it's choppy waters. It's difficult. It's crazy. It's like a maze sometimes. I, I describe it as kind of the, the healthcare maze where if you go through the wrong door, you fall off the cliff, right? And that's 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 not right. So the advice I I, I like to, to give people, hit, go into those clinics or call those clinics and say, can I talk to your, your caseworker or a social worker? Not only can they help you with health insurance, here's a little clue, they also can help you access housing if you're in trouble with your housing situation. If you are food insecure, if you don't have food to put on the table, oftentimes they can connect you with the local food bank and help you figure out how to get food on the table. So the best advice for people who have lost their jobs, are struggling, is don't panic and stay in your, your home by yourself. Don't freak out by yourself. Go into one of those clinics. And by the way, if you're freaking out and you've got some anxiety, they can help you with a little bit of mental health coverage as well at those clinics. So, so please reach out. Don't despair. We have systems of care built up. And again, they're, 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 not, they're not designed the way I would design them. We've designed them the way... We have to get people to survive the existing system um, or non-system of what we've got. But those that's where I would send them, Serena. It, it's, 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 there, it's very frustrating. It's very overwhelming when you first, particularly if you're somebody, and this happens, one of my good friends, um, he had a job from the time he was like 16 on. He worked his way through college. Everything was great. He had a job. He had insurance, went through all this stuff. His company went bankrupt and shut down. He jumped into the job market and thought he'd have a job right away. Within a couple of months, he was desperate. He didn't know what to do. He got sick. And he's like, you know, do I go to an emergency room? I'm like, well, you're really not emergent. You don't, you know, you're not dying. Go to this clinic. Here's a place to go. He called me later and was like, oh my God, thank you. They were the nicest people ever. They helped me access what I needed. I've got my medication. Now I, you know, and and it's I'm gonna figure out what to do. And I and when I get back on my feet, I'm gonna help them and help other people the best way I can. And so any of us are vulnerable to fall into that position. And but don't freak out. Go to your clinic. Find find your local system of care. Now, if you're in an urban or suburban area, there's usually lots of systems of care. The frustrating thing that I'm I'm working on right now, too, is across the country, a lot of our, our rural uh, community care systems are collapsing. Um, and we need we need to really work on rural access. Um, but you may you may end up having to go into town. Um, to find this uh, into into the nearest city, but but their their help is available to you if you reach out and find those clinics. Yeah, and I think that's a good you know that would be a very good conversation to be had um, on a show specifically for FQHCs. We do have within the Cities Changing Diabetes um, sort of like foundation and. Um, and uh, stakeholder family here in Houston, we do have several um, FQHCs that are very, very active. 
and we could bring them on the show, talk to them about, um, have them talk to our viewers about how to come into the system if they're if they're experiencing insurance loss or healthcare loss, job loss, those types of things. Um, so you can find out more about Cities Changing Diabetes by going to cityschangingdiabetes.com. Okay. So let's let's go on to what just a few other definitions I want to as we're um, as we're uh, progressing here, and then just kind of show a you know, all of these implications throughout a patient care model. Um, so just to talk about who your primary care provider is. So once you have insurance, you assign yourself a primary care provider. Um, this is the clinician you visit for common health problems, uh, for preventing and managing illnesses so that you don't get to catastrophic events. This person can then help you get into contact with a specialist. And these are some different types. Based on your insurance, you may have in-network or preferred providers. These are individuals who would be contracted, clinicians who would be contracted, and that reduces your costs because they have uh, contracts to provide care at a certain level with your insurance. There are also out-of-network providers who may not be contracted with your insurance, and because of that, they may cost you more. There's also excluded services that are not at all covered for or paid by your insurance. And so that's an important thing to look at, um, especially when you're trying to decide on a plan. Like Tim was mentioning, you want to um, meet with either a benefits manager or a health insurance specialist, someone who can help you kind of sift through the plan, see if the things that you need are excluded. If they are, then that may not be the plan for you. All right, so I wanted to get into some diabetes specific considerations for um, especially regarding equipment and supplies. So you have a medical benefit side and then you have a pharmacy benefit side. So like Tim was, was speaking about before. So we'll go back to those slides in just a minute because I want everyone to be able to see that and, and kind of read through it if they're visual learners. Um, but what's the difference between medical and pharmacy benefits? I know you you mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Yeah, Joey, it's, it's and, and again, for, for the average people that are busy in their lives and doing their job, you, you don't really think about this, but the medical benefit is your doctors and your hospitals, right? And, and things that you would go visit clinical stuff. The pharmacy is strictly for your drugs that you need. And mind you, not drugs that you can buy out in front of the counter, but the drugs you need behind the counter. Sometimes a, a, an insurance plan will have an, what they call an over-the-counter benefit, things like Tylenol and Advil and, and basic stuff that you would buy, or quite frankly, some of your diabetes supplies, some may have that, most don't. Most only have a pharmacy benefit for those services that you buy that you have to get from the pharmacist behind the counter. So when it comes to diabetes, it's really tough to use your insurance for some of your diabetes supplies because those are over the counter. Some will have a purchasing link on their website that you can go and get discounts for the things that you need. Some don't. You really have to shop for that and ask questions. And again, this is where that health insurance broker in your state can help you, that somebody that helps you buy your insurance can help advise you on your needs. And if you say, look, I have diabetes. Here are the things that I know I'm going to need from January 1 to the end of December. What what is the best way to do it? And then you can kind of talk through and figure out if it costs you, you know, four hundred dollars a month for your supplies that you buy over the counter. Does it make sense to pay five hundred dollars more a month in your premium to get that four hundred dollars? Well, no, of course not. But sometimes if you pay a hundred dollars extra on your premium, you may get that four hundred dollars covered if you know what your normal monthly expenditures are. And again, it's hard to figure some of this stuff out 
because you don't necessarily know, right? I mean, it, and, and, and who knows, halfway through the year, we might have a technological advance. One of my good friends that's got diabetes was showing me his, uh, his monitor that he has attached to the side of his stomach, and he does some really cool stuff with it, and it's brand new. Um, and these things didn't exist 10 years ago at all. You know, you, you know, the finger prick and all the things that you, that people have had to go through for years, these things are changing. So you're not necessarily, you can't always predict what your next year of costs are going to be, but, the, but primarily in the simple way to think about it is your pharmacy benefit covers what you get from behind the counter. Looks like Serena's got some. I have, <laughs> I, I have a question. So do people who have Medicaid or Medicare, would they have access to an insurance broker, a health insurance broker? No, not necessarily. When okay. you're well, in Medicaid. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Well, so it depends. So if you're in Medicaid, you get to choose your um, your plan provider. So some of those plan providers will actually give you a case manager that you can um that you can speak with that will help you, um, you know, you ch you choose the plan provider and those packages are set. I think Tim can explain this a little bit more, but you can ask a case manager to help you utilize those things. Um, but you're not going to be able to have a lot of choice, I think. So Joy, that's, that is the answer for Texas, but Medicaid, if you know one Medicaid plan, you know one Medicaid plan. <laughs> Unfortunately, every state of the country does it a little bit differently. So um, hit your state Medicaid website. Um, most states have, by now, I would hope they do. I mean, I think even, well, I won't bag on any states, but it, most states have websites now that can help you navigate the state Medicaid program. So Serena, it's a great question. Unfortunately, it depends on where you live as to whether or not that plan, and quite frankly, some Medicaid plans have very robust programs to help cover medi uh, uh, diabetes. Some states have very minimal plans to help you get your, 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 your coverage for diabetes. So it really, really, really depends on what state you live in. Interestingly enough, I've heard of people that have moved from one state to another because for basically the same job or the same income of what they're doing, some states have better Medicaid plans than others. And you're like, you literally relocated? And it's like, yeah, I know I've got diabetes. I've got this issue. I've got that issue. And if I stay in the state where I'm at, I get horrible care. But if I go to this other state, I get better care. So um, it's it's one of the most frustrating things about the United States of America's system is that, again, we, we have a non-system. So the advice we give you for what, what Joy mentioned about specific to Texas is great for Texas. But if you're in Pennsylvania or Florida or California, you may have a different system. So with regard to um, insurance and diabetes supplies, sometimes you may, you will need to ask your plan um, about this and you will need to research before you choose your plan. Many people research and they choose their plans based on this. Um, some diabetes supplies will be covered as durable medical equipment under your medical benefit side. So this may include insulin pumps, um, continuous glucose monitors, glucometers, blood pressure machines, and then other medically necessary items. If they are ordered through your physician to your pharmacy benefit side, they may be, may be denied if they are only covered under medical. So you have to know which side your orders will be made uh, um, under. Some individuals will be able to get a glucose meter by sending the order to the pharmacy, and some people will not be able to do that. They'll have to go through a contracted company that provides the, um, the pumps. And sometimes my patients will say, well, it wasn't covered at the pharmacy. And so I'll say, well, let's try the medical side. And they will have never tried the medical side and it's covered at 100% on the medical side. So it's very, very important to know on which side, which benefits cover you for what parts of your diabetes care. And it may be also less expensive to get your, um, your medications ordered to a mail order company 
that's contracted with your insurance instead of picking it up at the commercial pharmacy. So there's all sorts of like little ways that you want to learn how to use your covers, your coverage. Tim, did you want to say something? Yeah, we've really covered a lot of the basics, but there's even more complexity in almost every state when you're purchasing health insurance. There's things that you'll hear about HSAs or HRAs and all these other new acronyms. And, and each state, this, this is again why I advise people to use a broker or if you're in Medicaid, talk to uh, your caseworker. If you, if you have one in your state, talk to your clinic folks, because there are things that you can actually get some benefits from of these healthcare savings accounts that you can put in that can help lower your deductibles. There's, there's all sorts of kind of funky financing mechanisms that we haven't even touched on that really get it. I, I guess if I would say we're doing a 101 class right now on health insurance, but there's a whole nother level of kind of 202 and, and more complexity that I'm sure um, would make, it makes my head spin sometimes when I get into this stuff, but there's a lot of other of considerations um, that that navigators, um, brokers, uh, caseworkers can help you work through this process to get to to what is most beneficial to you. And and Rava for young you know companies, uh, they the, they can help you not only look at your personal needs but the needs of all your employees. So if you've got five or ten or twenty employees, they can help structure you know the plan uh, that best fits the needs for the entire company. And some additional lingo, <laughs> since we have tons of lingo, and you'll be able to go back and look through the slides as well. But another um, important consideration with diabetes care, um, as Serena and Raven know, is going to be quality um, quantity limits. So it is the amount or quantity of a medication that is covered by your plan, medication or um, say uh, strips that are covered by your plan during a uh, specific period of time. So this may, if you have to go over and above these quantity limits, you may have to get your physician's office to fill out some forms, medically doc document the need, um, send it back to the insurance for review, get it approved in order to cover that item. And this oftentimes comes up if someone is checking pre and post glucose, um, values because they're having a little bit of a challenge. Um, there may be, maybe they have something else going on. And so their glucose numbers are varying a lot. They may have to check 10 times a day, but they're only allowed two checks per day. Um, they will never make it to the end of the month with that limit of supplies. But there are some ways to override the quality, uh, the quantity limits, and you can do that with your clinicians. The other thing is the prior authorization. Dun, dun, dun. So it is a part of the insurance process um, where it asks you and your clinician um, to send forth um, medical documents. It could include your glucose logs. Um, it could be um, you know, your previous medications so that they can decide if a product or a service will be paid for in part or in full. The PA must be done before coverage is given. So Serena was talking about PAs. Oh man, I had so much, so many different experiences with that. You know, it's just like you go to the doctor, you want, even, even your doctor can have the, your best interest at heart and say, well, this, this particular medication would be wonderful for you. Let's see if we can get it. Then you come back and they say, yeah, unfortunately your insurance won't pay for it. And it's like, oh, so we got to choose another medication. And I hear about that a lot in peer support too. You know, they're like, well, this seems like a really good medication. I took this medication when I was in, in a different insurance plan. Now that I switched, they have to go through a prior authorization and now they're not covering it. I, I don't like this. You know, it comes up as a frustration. So yeah, I hear about prior authorization a lot. <laughs> and um, Reva, I know that you know, and you've, you know, living with diabetes, you've had to use different types of insulins. Um, 
just briefly, can you go over what that means to have an insurance company tell you that the insulin that you've been using um, for two years is no longer one that's contracted to be covered? So when that happens, it's a, it's obviously very frustrating because you've gotten used to your regimen. You have your you, you you know what to expect with that medication, right? So when that happens and you have to switch, there's an adjustment period of figuring out the right dosing, how your body reacts, tips and tricks that you've probably figured out with previous types of insulin that won't work for this insulin. Um, so it, and then also it's a burden on your healthcare provider because they have to work with you to figure out, okay, first of all, if you have someone like Joy, they were in a fight tooth and nail to like get you what you were already on, but that's time taken away from them able to do other things. So that's a productivity issue and you get someone on a new type of insulin and they have to invest more time in figuring out how to get that patient adjusted and in control without any side effects. So it's it's time, it's money, it's effort, all wasted. Yeah, and a delay in your personal self-care. Yeah. And um, thank you for saying that, Reva. I do, I'm probably a little bit more, you know, I <laughs> having lived with parents um, and family members um, and had to fight, you know, on sort of a caregiver side. Um, I understand when someone comes in and says, hey, it's January 1st and my insurance switched from, you know, Aspart to Lispro. And, you know, that's like, it's like first thing is first. Let's figure out, can we get this approved? Can we override it? Um, and then if we can't override it, then, you know, we go down, like you said, we start from scratch and we start, mm -hmm. how are you responding to this medication? How can we make it easier for you? Um, right. It's, you know, I think it's a, um, a journey of passion, I think, for those of us in, who are helping people with what's diabetes, for sure. So let's sum it up here with Sally going through all of our lovely terms. <laughs> so Sally doesn't feel well. She makes an appointment with her, her provider. She doesn't go to the emergency room because Tim said, no, no, no. So she goes to, <laughs> so she um, goes and she pays her copay at the office. She needs an x-ray. If she has met her deductible, she may owe that coinsurance. So a part of it, if she has not met her deductible, she will pay for the cost. If she meets her out of her plans out of pocket maximum for the year, she will owe anything. And from this point on, the healthcare plan will pay 100% of the in-network covered services. So that is you know, in a perfect world, right? She goes, she's able to pay the copay. She's able to pay her deductible. All of these things are very much dependent on whether or not she's able to do that. Um, so, and in some situations we know, like Serena was talking about and like Ray was talking about, it may be very difficult for a person to do that. So I think we know um, from what you were saying, Serena, and some, from some of our comments, that in the um, that we do have to have a discussion about what are alternatives, you know, if you don't have insurance coverage. Um, for those who do have insurance coverage, some helpful resources are going to be your plan's patient portal. Um, you can log in and find out what your plan covers for you. You can also get a health advisor um, to help you um, sift through all of the details. Your clinical team may be able to assist you as well. Your pharmacist can sometimes tell you if you need a 60-day supply written or a 90-day supply or a 30-day supply written, um, if that would be covered better. CoverMissouri.org has um, paired with Health Lit Literacy Media um, to create short videos and training modules. Um, it basically takes pieces of what we've talked about today provides them in two to three minutes. So you can see, hear, watch, share, take notes, all of those things. Do you all have any other advice for people? 
before we go, Tim? Oh, no, I think Tim is frozen. Oh, no, there he is. Right there. Uh, yeah, those are all great pieces of advice. Um, uh, and, and again, utilize whatever state, uh, most states have uh, assistant sites um, for your specific state. That Cover Missouri stuff is really for, for looking at insurance. It's great. It's, it's a very helpful website. Um, but, but particularly to what Serena was talking about as it relates to Medicaid. And if you're uninsured, uh, definitely hit your state uh, Medicaid website. And again, you can, you can search it. You, um, there's, there's almost every state has an assistant type, type program available for you to navigate that process. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say I, yourtexasbenefits.com. Uh, for people in Texas, uh, you can go there, especially if you're receiving Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, that will be a one-stop shop for you and calling 211. Super. Thank you all for being here with us, um, with me this morning to share what's a really complicated um, topic and try to help people. I get these questions every day about individuals health insurance um and you know i care for people with commercial insurance but also um people who have medicaid and medicare um and so they're it's very different from patient to patient um from plan to plan um from day to day from hour to hour <laughs> really so um i would you know advise everyone out there to um, please take some of these tips, find help, find someone who knows a lot about this topic so that they can help you um, sift through everything, okay? So thank you to our guests and to our um, viewers for joining. I'm super appreciative of the work that each and every one of you does for um, advocacy. You inspire those who work alongside you in this field. So we do have a quick survey on YouTube and Facebook where we'd like to get your feedback on the program as well as recommendations for future episodes. Please make My Diabetes HQ Live better by filling out this survey. We hope that today has grown your understanding of insurance, if only just a little. Use the resources to dig deeper because navigating insurance can um, help you make sure that you have the protection and the supplies and medications that you need. Mark your calendars. We will be broadcasting every Saturday, 10 a.m. Central and 11 a.m. Eastern on our, and our next episode will air next Saturday. So thank you and have a wonderful day. <laughs>